Good morning and welcome to Pray First, the conversation we have Monday through Friday right here on the Pastor Doug page. It is Wednesday, August the 18th, 2021, and we're talking today about the humanity of Jesus. Welcome. If you're a first-time guest, we're so glad that you were here. If you are a regular Pray First uh, tender Monday through Friday, the conversation we have at 7 a.m., hashtag live, hashtag recorded, hashtag shared, and get it out on your page. Hit the hearts, hit the likes, go crazy on those. And let all of our first-time guests know that we are glad that they are here. I see a few of you hitting them, but we need to see some hearts, and we need to see some thumbs, and we need to see them right now. Start punching this. Like, da -da 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 -da. And if you don't know this, you can punch them more than once. Da -da 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 -da. And for you who are uh, joining us today, maybe you saw it come up in your news feed, or a friend tagged you, or someone invited you, that is for you, and we're glad that you are here. It's a rainy day in the Mid-South around Olive Branch, Memphis, Tennessee area. Uh, but uh, it, and it's a little dark in my office. I didn't realize that. And if you're wondering, why does he have a purple office? Maybe I need to address that. We uh, have a smallish building uh, in Olive Branch, and we're kind of having to take over the neighborhood. <laughs> so we uh, acquired a house next door, and we put all of our offices in it and uh, conference rooms and stuff like that. But we needed more children's space. <clears throat> so I traded, or we traded, the, uh, the house uh, for the children's old building. And I am actually in the nursery. That's right, the nursery. Let me show you uh, just some of the, uh, the qualities of my, my nursery. Um, I have a, as you can see, I have a, let me... I have a metal uh, ABC board, <laughs> quite nice. Uh, it comes also with a hand sanitizer, a split door right here in the nursery. Uh, I have a split door. Uh, that, that's also, that's, you gotta have a split door in the nursery. Um, I mean, it just comes with so many amenities. Uh, you may wonder, you may be thinking that I've got this incredible system behind me. This here is actually, that's a changing table right there. Pastor Doug's, <laughs> Pastor Doug's office has a changing table uh, right there. Um, can also be used, can also be used. Extra storage, you know, Kleenex, your computer, uh, what, whatever you need right there. Uh, yeah, let me just scroll over. You see some Jarvis Bell paintings. I did win the number one dad in the world award this past year. Pretty proud of that. Uh, but yeah, there's so many things that you can do with the diaper changer. You may not have known that. Put that right there. And all their little coat, you know, the, all their little jackets and stuff became my little jacket area over there. But you know what? <clears throat> Kid's got a big, nice building because of it, and I, I kind of like my Barney purple room. Today we're talking about the humanity of Jesus. Just thought, I just thought I'd answer the question: Why is Pastor Doug's office purple? That's why. There's one thing that Jesus was that Jesus will never be again. One thing. That Jesus was, <laughs> I see what you said, uh, Courtney. Uh, another thing that comes with the children's building is a lifetime supply of Lysol, uh, sanitizer. Uh, in the bathroom in there, I still have a closet full of diapers in various sizes. If you need diapers in various sizes, I'm your man. There's one thing that Jesus... <laughs> was that he will never be again. Do you know what that is? Because, you know, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. There's one thing that he was that he'll never be again. And it's great that he was, and it's great that he'll never be again. And that thing that Jesus was that he'll never be again is human. Everybody hashtag human. H U man, who man, human. Jesus will never be what he once was, and that is a human. 
Now, you need to understand something right now. Jesus, God, became a human, but he is not a human anymore. You see, God didn't become like you. When Jesus was born, he didn't become like you. You were created like him. I'll say that again because it's important, the foundation of this. Jesus, when he was born to Mary, he didn't become like Mary. He created Mary like him. In the image and in the likeness of God, he created Adam uh, and in the same way he created Eve, in male and female, he created them. Uh, <clears throat> but he did that so that humanity and God could be compatible when the Holy Spirit conceived in Eve and created, not, not, not in Eve, when, when the Holy Spirit conceived in Mary, excuse me, and, and created Jesus, <clears throat> that they were compatible. Now, this is important to you today. This is not just a history test, and it's not just uh, biology and anatomy, physiology. It's not that, but partly that. Jesus became a human. God, this has got to be driven in you. This isn't semantics. This is important. If, if there's any part of doctrine that's important or theology, this is important. God became a human. He could do that because he created the pathway for it. He had made man and woman in his image in Adam and Eve. And then when it come time for Mary, you can see he already had the plan to do this. Uh, he didn't have to become like us necessarily. He had already created us in his likeness. Okay, so we'll continue from there. Jesus, however, is not human now. You'll recognize him, you'll see him, but he was like that before. Uh, even before the New Testament, when uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into the fire, Nebuchadnezzar recognized there was four men in the fire and that the fourth one looked like the Son of God. Where, where do you get that information? I don't know. But he'll be recognizable, he will be Jesus, but he is not human he is God, but he once was. He once was human. And this is known as, there, this is a, this is a, uh, what do you call it? This is a strategy that is known as identification. Identification. Everybody hashtag identification. It's a political strategy now. It's not just what God, what Jesus did, but it's a political strategy. And here's how I can describe identification to you. Now, don't leave because of all this foundation work, because it matters. All this matters to you. The political, uh, the political strategy of identification is, is that a politician will fly to Iowa. He will get in a motorcade, and he will put on... Uh, cowboy boots, and he'll put on a flannel shirt, and he'll put on a hat, and he'll walk out on a you know a flatbed trailer out in the middle of a cornfield, and he'll say, uh, "I studied agriculture at so and so," or "My grandfather was a uh, fifth century farmer in Bahia, Mississippi," and. I know what you're going through as a farmer. I remember spending my summers down on the farm with my granddaddy, and I remember shucking corn and, and hauling peas and having purple thumbs, and I remember those things. I understand what you're going through. Therefore, I can represent you. That is identification as a politician. Then he'll get back in the motorcade. He'll go back to the airport on the plane. He'll put on a factory jacket and he'll they'll hand him a hard hat and he'll walk into a factory and he'll say my mother worked in a factory uh, she assembled let's just say toyotas in blue springs mississippi and i know what it takes when she would come home at night and how tired she would be and how her her check would get us to this point it's identification it is a strategy 
of identification. I know how you feel. I know what you're going through. I can represent you. Okay, so now you've got him representing the farmer. You've got this man representing the factory worker. And so he gets back on the plane and he flies to, I don't know, Destin, Florida. And he has on his fishing gear, his tackle box in hand, and he walks out on a uh, dock and he says that my uncle was a fourth generation fisherman and I understand what you're going through. I can represent you. In other words, it's the strategy of identification. Jesus didn't settle for the strategy of identification in as much as the illusion of identification. He wasn't changing clothes. He, he wasn't walking to the pier and saying, you know what, I'm wearing a, uh, a tackle box today on my jacket, uh, therefore I can represent you. He wasn't walking into the field and saying, you know, I'm wearing cowboy boots today, I can, I can represent you. He wasn't walking into the factory and saying, I'm, you know, I'm wearing my hairnet and I'm wearing my hard hat and I'm wearing my, my factory jacket, therefore I can re represent you. Jesus didn't settle for the illusion of identification. Jesus actually became the farmer. Jesus actually became the factory worker. Jesus actually, became, he didn't know somebody who was one. He wasn't related to one who did it one time. He didn't just go down to the pier and dress like a fisherman. He, he, he became the fisherman. That's why he can represent the farmer. He can represent the factory worker. He can represent the fisherman because Jesus became a human he can represent humans before God himself and say, I didn't know somebody who was one. I am somebody who was one. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 in the New Living Translation, because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also, the Son of God, also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die. Think about that. For only as a human being could he die. And only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Only by becoming a human being could Jesus represent human beings through propitiation and suffering and dying on behalf of other human beings. That's Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 in the New Living. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17 in the New King James. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren. Don't confuse that. His brethren were already made like him. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was was God. In the image and likeness of us, let us make man. It wasn't just let me, it was let us, God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Let us make man in our image. So in the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them, that he might be merciful. Listen, everybody hashtag merciful. Why does it matter to you that he become a human being? That he might be merciful and a faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, which is so big, seemingly so elusive, seemingly so incomprehensible, pertaining to God to make propitiation. Propitiation is that he provided the full sacrifice for people's past, present, and future sins, peoples who are past, present, and future. Propitiation means he has paid it all. It is all done. There is no sin that was ever performed, committed. There is no sin that is being committed, and there is no sin that will ever be committed that isn't already paid for. Jesus fully paid for sin. People do not go to hell for sin. People go to hell for failing to receive the free gift of life which is Jesus Christ. No one goes to hell because of sin, past, present, or future. 
The wages of sin is death, but we all go through death. No one goes to hell because of sin. The only ones that go to hell are those who reject the free gift of God. Full propitiation for the sins of the people. Why? Because Jesus became a human and he took, he didn't, he didn't just represent. He took all of the sin upon him and crucified it. For in that he himself has suffered, listen to this, for in that he himself has suffered, God didn't suffer. The humanity of Jesus suffered. He himself has suffered being tempted. God wasn't tempted. The humanity in Jesus was tempted. He is able to aid those who are also tempted. How many of you have ever been tempted? How many of you have ever needed aid? How many of you have ever needed help? How many of you have ever needed mercy? So that God could aid, so that God could help, so that God could be merciful, so God could understand, so God could take care of, God became one of us. Not the illusion of one of us, not the illusion of identification, but he became one of us. And now we have a high priest that understands us. Understand, God didn't understand our limitations. God didn't understand our sin. God didn't understand our temptations. God did not understand that we needed mercy. But Jesus, who became one of us, understands all of that because he was one of us. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. For we do not have a high priest, for we do not have is in the negative connotation. Let's just change it to what it actually says. For we do have a high priest who can sympathize with our weakness. Let me read it as it's written. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. What it's actually saying is, therefore, we have a high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses. We have a God, because he became a human, who can sympathize with your weakness. What's, what's, what's your weakness? Usually it's your sin. It's the sin that you trespass in. That's your weakness. He, he doesn't condone our sin. He's he's propitiated our sin. He's forgiven our sin, but he also sympathizes. He knows the temptation you're struggling with. He knows what it's like to live for 33 years and be chased by the enemies of God and to be chased by demons and to be having flesh feelings. He knows that. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but in all points tempted as we are without sin. Let us, therefore, since that is true, come boldly before the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace. Notice it's not a throne of judgment. It's not even a throne of a correction. It's not a throne of, you need to do better. It's not a throne of, well, I guess you're disqualified. It's not a throne of, we need to punish you. It is a throne of grace and a throne of mercy. And it's the only reason you and I can approach it boldly because you and I are guilty of sin. Amen? I mean, we are absolutely, positively guilty. But the difference here is, is that the one who represents the guilty became the guilty that I might have no condemnation in the courtrooms of heaven so that a righteous God holding a righteous gavel, can drop his righteous gavel and say, Tawana Walker is not guilty. Courtney Wooten is not guilty. I, I, Courtney Wooten rushing, let me give your whole name there. Donna Rowe, not guilty. Randy Bell, not guilty. Clay Hedges, Neil Hedges, all the Hedges, not guilty. Raymond Duffy, not guilty. David Cook, 
not guilty. Doug Bell, not guilty. Audra Shoemaker Scott, not guilty. Barbie Shook, not guilty. Marilyn Adams, not guilty. You're not going to go to hell because you're guilty. You're going to go to hell because you didn't have the right lawyer. You didn't have the right representative. Jesus came and became our high priest, the propitiation of our sin, representing us, becoming a human, tempted in every way, understanding every thought, yet not guilty. So we can approach, come on, you can approach God today without guilt, shame, and condemnation. It's a throne of grace and not judgment. Jesus is sympathetic because he's been there. The one sitting on the throne of grace has been a human. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, for every person listening and every person watching, I pray right now, God, that you'd be with them, that you would take care of them. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. So part of our having offices in a nursery, I didn't want you to think that I would deceive you. So here we go. We got our got our wipes right there. A little Johnson and Johnson baby powder right there. Oh, oh, oh. What other pastor has some some safety plug protectors right there. Got that right there. Uh, it looks like di looks like cloth diapers, but I'm positive we didn't use cloth diapers. Maybe it's just a like a burping cloth. We got some Medela micro steaming bags. Playtex. Oh yeah 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 yeah. That's a bottle. That's a bottle thingy. And then here we go, buddy. Can't you just smell them little jokers? And I don't mean the used ones. I mean. There they are, right there. All right, I'm going to get out of here because, man, some of y'all evidently got nothing better to do. 51 folks still live in here as I show you the diaper closet. You guys have a great day, and I will see you tomorrow. Bye.